Thank you very much, Egerit, for this introduction. Um, that's really a bit of embarrassing for me. But very nice. Thank you. We also owe thanks to Nantes Buch Stiftung and the Literaturhaus uh, Munich. Thank you very much. And especially to um, Tanja Graf and uh, Frau Firmenich. And um, also, I have a strong reason to believe that you all know Robert McFarlane. Uh, please let me shortly introduce um, by summing up some facts on him before um, we start with the readings. Robert McFarlane was born in Nottinghamshire in a um, village called Hallam and um, in the English Midlands. He was educated at Pembroke College. Hmm? No, I wasn't born there. Oh. In the Midlands. Pouring, pouring water. No, <laughs> that's what I, I, I was born in, Hay, uh, in Oxford, in Oxfordshire. No, in Oxford. yeah. yeah. Halem's in Nottinghamshire. But educated at Pem Pembroke College. Pembroke. Yeah. In Cambridge and Magdalen College in Oxford. He began his PhD at Emmanuel College. Cambridge in 2000. Close enough. <laughs> and, and in 2001, he was elected um, a fellow at the college. In 2012, he made a fellow... He was made fellow at the Royal Society of Literature, and he's the founding trustee of the Charity Action for Conserva Conservation. Hmm? <laughs> just, sorry, <laughs> just 27 years old, Robert McFarlane wrote his first book in what he would later call the loose trilogy of books about landscapes and the human heart. This first book um, was called Mountains of the Mind, and it has been published in German 2011 with AS Publisher, who is specialized in sports and outdoor books. I mention this uh, because I think it's a hint to one of the problems we will later talk on this evening uh, and also the next days. The problem is um, where has, has nature writing a place in German literature and in German uh, literary landscape. But let's stick to this uh, brief introduction. After the publication of Mountains, in the Mind, uh, Mountains of the Mind in 2003, the book won the Guardian First Book Award, the Somerset Moham Award, and the Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year Award. With his first book, Robert McFarlane defined his writing style and his approach towards landscape, place, travel, and nature. He takes the reader on a journey through history while allowing himself to be part, part of the narrative. In becoming visible to the reader, he lets us see through his eyes, lets us discover what he discovered in the exact same order. In doing so, we can feel his enthusiasm and his fascination for the natural world. His books usually start with a simple question and end in a colorful kaleidoscope of poetic description, descriptions, rare encounters, historical reasoning, and philosophical reflections. In Mountains of the Mind, it was the question, why is it that people have always been drawn to the mountains despite their dangers? Next to his work as professor at Cambridge University, um, he, Robert wrote not only several other books, <laughs> from some of them he will read for us tonight. McFarlane also wrote a libretto to a jazz opera entitled, the, uh, entitled Untrue Island. He even worked on a documentary film about mountains in 2017. Um, so Robert McFarlane has proven to be a polymath uh, for the natural world. His influence in the way we talk about, perceive, and understand landscape, the environment, and nature is nothing but exceptional. I'm highly impressed how he became one of the most important, or better, the most important promoter of classical writing on nature, places, and landscape. He never gets tired in his strongest effort to hint at and explain writers such as his friend Roger Deakin, Nan Shepard, Laurie Lee, Edward Thomas, John Muir, John McPhee, and many, many more. But that's not all. <clears throat> he teaches a whole generation of writers a language which would have almost been forgotten, forgotten and, and enabled them to choose a perspective of courage and wit. Many writers of the younger generation would not write the way they do or would, known without him, or would be known without him. With only 41 years, 42 years, 41. Right, <laughs> of age, we can all be excited to see which path he will take next, and about that we will talk about later. But before continuing by questions, um, 
how this all is possible, let's have a look at another question Robert McFarlane wrote a book on. It's the question, for how long can I follow a certain path and are certain paths and ways maybe older than they seem? The book is called The Old Ways, A Journey on Foot. It was published in 2012, was chosen 18 times as a book of the year for 2012. The German translation by the prize-winning team Andreas Jandl and Frank Sievers, who is joining us tonight, was published in 2016. I'm happy that Robert will read now some parts of the book. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Andreas. Everybody can hear me fine, and in Kazakhstan and, uh, and the UK. Um, warmest thanks, first of all, to everybody who's, who's here tonight and who's brought, brought this evening and the coming days into being. I, I'm, I'm huge, hugely grateful for, the, for all the work that's gone in. And, uh, and to these writers who've traveled to be here as well. I, I'm, I'm very, very excited. Um, thank you then for the, this series of introductions. I feel like the, the parcel that has been passed around with layers being removed, waiting for the treasure to emerge, only to find that it's a pair of Marks and Spencer's black socks. Um, <laughs> so I, I feel I can only disappoint you from this point in. But, no, I, 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 I have many hopes for the coming two days. Uh, among them are to, to unsettle some of the thinking around nature writing that, that may come first, that may come most easily. Indeed, to unsettle the term nature writing itself, which to me has serves purpose, but also in a sense has, has served its purpose and has, has lost much of its meaning. And to wonder what, what might come in its place, how this writing can be alive to the present as well as, as it were, deep, deep to the past, how it can be a, a very, very contemporary literature, because something extraordinary has happened in Britain over the past 20 years. And on the one hand, it's reached back a millennium, and on the other, it is thinking very, very hard about a state of crisis that we're in at the moment and a set of possible futures that we, that we face now. So I, I want, from the very beginning, to think of this kind of writing as pluriform, as diverse, as biodiverse, as urgent, as necessary, at its best, and it isn't always at its best. Uh, and I want to think of it as having a necessary reach back, but also a necessary prospect forwards. So, that all said, I'm going to read you a section from the old ways. We're I'm going to read four times tonight in various kind of rhythms and extents. Um, two of those readings will be from un unpublished work, work I've just finished in the last month, a book called Underland and, and, and the strangest thing I've ever written called Ness. So that's to come, but first I'll start with the old ways. And I'm gonna go up to the podium, so I'll leave this behind. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Excellent. All right. So this, the scene is this. Uh, I, I, this book is about ways of navigating landscape that also become, in a sense, ways of navigating self and community. Uh, we, we live by the stories we tell ourselves, and the oldest story is a, a walk, and the oldest record of a story is a path. We make prints as we go in both senses, and this compact between writing and walking and telling and traveling is, is as old as literature. It's older than literature. It's there in the Epic of Gilgamesh. That's what starts all this off. But here I'm, I'm, I'm following a story, and I'm following a story as it moves across water, and the water is the water of the Minch, the band of water that separates the Outer Hebrides from mainland Scotland. And the man I'm with is a man called Ian Stephen, who is a storyteller who tracks stories as they move by sea roads, water paths, and he watches how they change when they land in new places. They take on new vernaculars, they get adapted, and partway through this you'll hear one of the most extraordinary stories he told me. But at the moment we're setting off and we're going to sail to a small island group called the Shants. And we're setting off in an old open boat. Okay. Mid-morning departure, Stornaway Harbour, which is also known as the Hoyle, hints of oil, hints of hooli, sound of boat slip, reek of diesel. Broad bays wake through the harbour as a tugged line through the fuel slicks on the water's surface, our keels slurring petrol rainbows, light quibbling on the swell. We nose through the chowder of harbour, 
kelp, oranges, plastic, milk bottles, sea gunk. Big seals floating here and there, their nostrils and eyes just above the water, their blubbery backs looking like the puffed up anoraks of murder victims. Nostrils up, snort, snort, duck to rinse, and then dive with a final flip of the flukes. Out we went by oar, sail and tow past the drug money pleasure gardens and castle of James Matteson, who in 1844 used half a million pounds of the money he made pushing opium to the Chinese to buy the whole island of Lewis. Out past the lighthouse, out past the headlands, the sea opening like a cone into the minch. The sun above us, bright and high, but the sky darkening swiftly further out. The sea, graphite, lightly choppy, white stippled, the wind a near southerly, force three or four with just a touch of east in it. A good strength for a little boat like ours, but from the worst of directions. Our sea road led us south-southeast, but it's impossible to sail directly upwind. We'd have to make long tacks. Two other boats left the Hoyle with us, a full-size Skornisha called Ansulera, the Gannet, with a crew of five, and a seagoing yacht, keeping watch in case of trouble. Ian and I were together in Little Broad Bay. Let's get the sail up, show the people we're leaving well, said Ian. So I hoofed and hauled the big yard to the spar top, the main sheet tightened and lightly jammed, the terracotta sail luffed, then filled, Broad Bay surged southwards through the water, and my heart leapt in my chest. Our wake spooling white behind us, our track record, the water going past fast with a hiss like poured sand. So we sail, and then as we're sailing, leaving our wake behind us, Ian starts telling me a story, which is another kind of trail. Mostly as a sailor, I did all right that day. Admittedly, there was the moment during attack when I dropped the yard, a 12-foot pole of pine, from 10 feet up down onto Ian's shoulders. Some disagreement still remains between us over the nature of the incident. I was adamant the spar's descent had been controlled if acceptably over-accelerated. Ian was adamant, once he'd stopped swearing, that it had been purely dropped. Hearing that delivered in a Hebridean accent uh, stops you short. On a long tack, Ian told me the story of the blue men of the Minch. In poor weather, or big seas, he said, the blue men would come for your boat. They'd haul themselves, embodiments of storm and high water, Malicious mermen dripping onto the deck, ready to pull you down. But then, he said, they give you a chance. One chance. The leader of the blue men casts you a rope. What he does is he throws you a line of verse. And one by one, everyone on board, from the skipper down, needs to offer a reply in like rhythm and meter. If one man fails, well... You've had your chance, and the vessel is pulled down to the seabed with all men drowned. If by some chance all can answer poetically, well, then the ship is freed, and the blue men, those slimy bastards, slide away to find another victim. He grinned. So you see, it's eloquence that gets you out of trouble. And we then um, come into the shants, just as the tide is turning. Ah, you can see the shape standing clear now, Ian said, gazing ahead. Then, quietly to himself, what a life, what a life. The tide fell slack just as we reached the outstretched arm of Eileen Vura, the most easterly of the shants. The, will, the wind fell light, and Broad Bay trembled almost to a halt. All that paused water, unsure of its obligations, simmering, waiting for command, the lateral drive of the ebb tide canted to the vertical play of the slack tide. Gouts of water bulged up from deep down, polishing areas of ocean. Currents billowed and knotted. The light flimsy, filmy, the earth open on its hinges, unsure of its swing. Suddenly the glossy black fin and back of a minky whale rose a hundred yards astern, Two yellow striped dolphins broke water and plunged cheerily down again, and then the flow of the turned tide could be seen as a chop on the water, small standing waves that indicated the whole minch was reversing its direction. 
trillions of tons of brine, a mountain range of water turning in obedience to the invisible force of the moon, starting the long, long slop back north and carrying our little boat with it. I'll just read two more paragraphs about coming in as dusk falls under the birds, because the shants are one of the few places in the Scottish island groups where bird populations are doing okay. You may have seen the recent headlines about the calamitous crashes of bird populations on Shetland. Puffin populations down from 33,000 birds to 570. Kittiwakes 55,000 to 5,000. This is brought about by uh, it's multifactorial, clearly. Um, sand eels, which are the predominant food of puffins and many of these seagoing birds, being affected by, by fishing, by climate change. Birds are having to fly further to find food that weakens them. They live very much on the margins in terms of energy transactions anyway. And these, these great colonies that have filled these cliffs and these islands with sand for so long are falling silent. Something is very, very wrong, and there are so many indicators of this. We know this. We know the German study about has just come out recently that has shocked the world about insect Mageddon, as it's become known, about the drastic crash of insect populations since 1945. The stats are coming in, and we're still not doing anything about it. On the shants, things look a little better, and this is what that life was like in 2012 when I came in. We neared our anchorage under Garve Eileen in dusk light, a cliff of dolerite columns rearing above the water, shattered columns at its foot. Even in the twilight, the rock was visibly glowing with orange lichen, like a low burnt fire. A sound came from above, through the shadow, an amplified riffle, banknotes being whirred through a telling machine. It was the compound wing noise of puffins, thousands of puffins crisscrossing the sky with their busy roosting flights. More distantly, I could make out the sound of sociable puffin chirrups, evening gossip from the birds in their nest spots on the cliff. I watched them fly, their flight paths so dense, and yet none of them colliding or even seeming to adjust their routes to avoid each other, living at busy cross-purposes, but convivially. I thought of each towing a thread behind it and the weft they would make with their looming. Stop there. Another book um, uh, that impressed me a lot was The Wild Places that has been published in 2007 and uh, in German translation in 2015, also with Andreas Jandl and Frank Siebers. And uh, in this book, um, you are describing at one point um, your kind of a method that you try to um, describe uh, the countryside in another way. You um, uh, Countrysides are described this, the description is a map, for example, and you want to um, do it in another way, in a literary way, to um, create a new map, a new way of description. Is this um, a kind of a, a, a way to do nature writing, to replace descriptions? Well, I, I, I'm very interested in what is often called counter-mapping, and, and counter-mapping is a, a form of, you could say, resistant cartography. So often politically motivated, often a way of remapping a site that has had its predominant cartography carried out by a, by a power group of some kind. So an example of that might be uh, where I first met this idea was in the extraordinary book Maps and Dreams by Hugh Brody, the anthropologist who worked up in um, northwest Canada with indigenous people there, uh, with First Nations people, and at the same time as, and we see many versions of this at work today, multinationals were seeking to push a, an oil pipeline down through native land. And he describes this extraordinary, incompatible mapping, this exchange of cartographies that went on between these two groups. The pipeline uh, implementers would bring their, their maps and unroll them, and these were satellite-based grid maps, very familiar kinds of mapping. But they, of course, all mapping excludes. We know that. The, um, 
First Nations people would bring their maps, which were dreaming maps, they were hunting maps, they were resource maps, they were alert, they were resource maps as well. The oil pipeline is a resource map, but they were alert to where the food sources were to be found in a particular month, following a particular kind of moon. They, they moved between a form of natural history, a form of mythology, a form of community. And these two mappings were just incompatible. So counter mapping is a way of, of remapping a landscape with a view to pushing back against power. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that that is what the Wild Places does, but I certainly thought of it as a way of unrolling a different kind of map, a map that pushed against the road atlas. That was the, um, that was the which I think is the map by which so many of us see or saw before the advent of um, uh, Google mapping, effectively pocket carried Google mapping. The road atlas has its priorities, and that was that was what I grew up with in the footwell. You know, you'd pick up the AA the AA map, and that's that's how you read and met a new place that you went to. You followed that. Um, so a, a form of mapping that could be deep through language, deep through time, alert to natural histories as well as uh, structural ones and built environments. That was what I set out to do. Feels like it was a book written by another person, though. And uh, it's a book, let's stick another question to this, um, to this book, because it's also a book about Roger Deakin. Um, I have the impression you, you um, tell the story of your friend and also of his um, passing away and, his, uh, and the funeral. Could you um, tell us something about Roger Deakin? Yeah, I, I don't know how many people in this room know Roger's work. Um, uh, many people, I suspect, will. If, if not, you, you will soon be able to, to read it in, in German. Um, yes, he, he was an extraordinary man who uh, lived many kinds of life. He was a green man. That's what I always think. I think of that figure of the green man that speaks in leaves and that leaves speak into. And he was also a water man. He made ripples everywhere he went. Um, rather than splashes on the whole. And he and I came to know each other late in, as it turned out, late in his life. And he was uh, an extraordinary influence on, on me and, and continues to be on many people who've never met him. I'm Roger's executor, and the number of letters I get from people wishing they'd met this man, knowing him through his writing, feeling that that great green strange, warm, wild spirit, and, um, and writing to me as though I could somehow summon him back for them, uh, which I can't. But yes, this book, The Wild Places, was overtaken. Roger and I traveled together a lot through those years uh, of, of traveling and writing, and then he, he was diagnosed with a very aggressive brain cancer uh, and died very fast. And... Um, the book unexpectedly becomes about that, that loss and how I remember reading Robert Frost's uh, poem, A Swinger of Birches, to Roger towards the end of his life. And I remember him telling me, it was the first time I'd ever heard about it, I remember him telling me about the, how trees communicate by mycorrhizal fungal networks, how trees we now know this through, partly through Peter Volleben's book and, and others, um, how we now know that trees can be understood not as single individuals competing within a forest environment, but as a collaborative, almost superorganism, working together, sharing, potentially trading, potentially sharing resources through the fungal network. And that seemed to me a version of what Roger did and what good writing can do, which is move move material around, good material around, out of sight, underground, joining and f nourishing and, and growing. And he still does that. There's a walnut tree. It's quite a big tree now, but I remember we met it uh, the summer before he died near my house, and it must have come from a horse poo, I think. It was on a bridle path. And it was just a sapling, but Roger lived at Walnut Tree Farm, so he knew a walnut when he saw one. And he said, there's a walnut. And I thought, oh, yeah. And now whenever I pass that walnut, it gets a year bigger. And, uh, and there it is, still growing like him. So, yeah. 
you are citing the poem of Robert Frost um, in the book as well, and it's very moving at that uh, part because it's about his passing away. And um, yeah, and um, in this book you are also um, climbing trees <laughs> from time to time. <laughs> and um, and I remember Frank Sievers and Andreas Janl when they visited you, they told me that they tried to climb trees as well. <laughs> and um, what's the function of climbing trees? <laughs> what's the function of climbing trees? Fun. Um, uh, uh, yeah, look, if you live in Cambridge, you take any height you can get. Uh, <laughs> this is the Fens, and uh, we, you know, you get Horizontigo. You can stand on a chair and look into Norfolk. Uh, so um, we, we do tall buildings pretty well, uh, and uh, we, we've got some mighty trees. So, yeah, I, uh, one of the many pleasures of being published in Germany has been being translated by, by Andreas and Frank. Uh, and one of the pleasures of being translated by them was that they came to visit me uh, before they began work, or as they were working on my book and, and Roger's book and The Peregrine by Baker. And we went, I took them on a magical mystery tour of uh, storm beaches and Holloways and peregrine haunts and my places. And I got, I got them up a tree. I couldn't guarantee to get them down again. It was <laughs> getting up proved quite difficult, I think, but uh, no, we, we had an amazing time, and they, they threw themselves into the landscape and, and, and the language as well, and, uh, well, and are rightfully acclaimed as prize-winning translators and my friends. Um, the book um, that came out lately, um, it's uh, called The Lost Words, and it's a kind of um, children's books or a book for adults as well, a kind of all-age books. Um, could you tell us more about um, the, um, the way you, you found the idea of this book? It has yeah. an incredible success in, in England, the book. So it's, it's, it's this book. Um, I, may, I may be blocking out the, um, the background by holding it up, but um, this, this book came about because in, in 2007, in quite a now, it's almost a meme now, cliche or a meme, depending on how you look at it, uh, a very well-known children's dictionary, which is widely used across British primary schools, issued a new edition, and it was noticed that out of that edition had been taken 40 words, 40-odd words, to do with everyday nature. And those words began with acorn, and they went through adder, bluebell, conker, catkin, heron, kingfisher, and they went all the way through to willow, and wren, and they formed in this way a, a sort of crooked, almost A to Z. And the words that came into that children's dictionary were attachment, block graph, broadband, MP3 player, which didn't last very long, um, and uh, bulletin, blog post, etc. And this, for many people, became not a, not a cause, but a very charismatic moment where Childhood had lost a, a basic closeness, a very simple everyday literacy of the everyday creatures and plants with which we should share our lives and make room for. And the inclusion in the dictionary is, is descriptive rather than prescriptive. It's based on an algorithmic analysis of a very large corpus of texts. So a uh, digital analysis runs through and says, these words are being used this many times, and these are being used this many times. And then you look at your frequency, and you take words out based on frequency of usage, which is to say that the omission of the words was a reflection of their lack of use in the language used by children and read by children. So that was the cultural symptom that in 2007 caught many people's imaginations and kind of horror, <laughs> and um, Jackie Morris, the artist, and I began work many years later on a, a very simple book that took 20 of those names from Acorn through to Wren, and we wanted to summon them back into children's mouths and lives as best we could at a time when many of them are vanishing, starling down 70% since uh, the 1970s, uh, Skylark, down 59% population in, in Britain. And this extraordinary thing has happened to the book since, um, since it was published. And it's become the subject of 
I think there are now 34 different crowdfunding campaigns to get the book, a copy of the book into every primary school. Uh, all of Scotland's been done. All of Wales is underway. All of Welsh care homes, prisons, primary schools in seven London boroughs in 15 British English counties. It's now spreading to America um, and, uh, and beyond. And we every day receive photographs of children and school teachers out, outside, learning, naming, making, mapping, building. There are two schools that now have lost words outhouses, outdoor classrooms. Um, and um, so something very strange has happened. And as I was saying to Andreas, it's not really to do with the book. It's to do with what we're here to talk about, which is about fear and love and loss. And it is no um, coincidence that the 20 years in which nature writing has flourished in Britain have also seen Britain come to a point where in the 2016 State of Nature report, it was described as one of the most nature-depleted countries in the world. We are writing out of a, a moment of loss, and the responses to that loss take the forms of fury, <laughs> anger, um, mourning, elegy, grief, um, and sometimes um, hope. And that, that mixture, we need all of it. We need absolutely all of it. So the lost words came out of both a sense of loss and a sense of hope. Would you like to read from the book? Yeah, I'll from just the read. Lost words? I'll, no, leave that there. So we call it a spell book, partly because the spells in it are arranged acrostically, so they spell out the first letters of the lost creature. So it is a summoning spell, but there, it also has, we wanted to give it the characteristic of a, a grimoire. Unfortunately, because I have the artistic ability of a, of a dog, um, I was blessed with the most extraordinary co-author in, in Jackie Morris, who is a, a, a dazzling artist. But I wrote these spells, and I wrote them to be read aloud, because I, that's what I wanted children to do, and I wanted parents to do to their children, and I wanted anyone to do. And so I wrote them to, be, to taste good in the mouth. And I learned a lot from Beowulf and Gawain and the Green Knight and Alice Oswald and Ted Hughes and Helen Mort, who's here right now. So I'll just read you Otter, and you might be able to hear the letters being spelt out, but it doesn't really matter if you can't. Otter. Otter enters river without falter. What a supple slider out of halt and into water. This shape shift as a sheer breath taker, a sure heart stopper, but you'll only ever spot a shadow flutter. Bubbles skein and never, almost never, actual otter. This swift swimmer's a silver miner. With trout its oar, it bores each black pool deep and deeper, delves up current, steep and steeper, turns the water inside out, then inside outer. Ever dreamed of being otter? That utter underwater thunderbolter, that shimmering twister. Run to the riverbank, otter dreamer. Slip your skin and change your matter. Pour your outer being into otter and enter now as otter without falter into water. Um, I think, is my German translator here? <laughs> Thank you. Frank, are you going to be translating these spells? Okay. <laughs> no. Um, it's, it's going to be translated by Daniela Seel, uh, who is a, a very famous, you might know her, um, poet. Um, fantastic. Yeah. Well, she will need to turn the otter spell inside out, then inside out. Um, <laughs> do I have time to read one more spell? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I'm actually going to read Bluebell, the Bluebell spell, because um, this has been since been read at, I think, three weddings. And... I must say, it's not the spell that I would choose to read at my wedding. So I'll read it out, and you can, you can think about whether, whether, whether you'd have it at your wedding. Um, OK. It's been beautifully set to music by Kerry Andrew as well. It's, on, it's online somewhere. Bluebell. Blue flowers at the blue hour. Late daylight in a bluebell wood. Under branch, below leaf, billows blue, so deep, 
sea deep, each step is taken in an ocean. Blue flows at the blue hour, colour is current, undertow. Enter the wood with care, my love, lest you are pulled down by the hue, lost in the depths, drowned in blue. You may kiss the bride. Um, <laughs> You were talking about loss, and uh, this this is a book about um, lost words. And um, at around that time, I think another book um, uh, you wrote on another book. It's landmarks. And um, <clears throat> and uh, what's um, the origin or what's the idea behind landmarks? It's about the same idea, I think. It's about um, losing words for nature. About yeah, I. I, my, my summum bonum in most things is diversity. Um, and it seems to me that we should relish a diversity of language as we should relish many other kinds of diversity. And that as our nature has been depleted, what Michael McCarthy calls the great thinning that is underway now every second ongoing around us as we sit here, that one thing we can do is look to replenish the language we have to wild it again. And when I began looking into the language for and of landscape that exists in the many languages and dialects of the island group we call Britain or many other things besides, I found an astonishing word hoard that runs through thousands of years and ranges from the many, many Anglo-Saxon distinctions between kinds of hill and angles of slope through to the extraordinary Gallic, responsive, reactive, poetic richness of discourse with regard to moorland, which many people would dismiss as self-similar. And it seemed to me that this language could in some way begin to re-pristinate ways of seeing and thinking and talking about about the landscape we live in and that lives in us. And so I began, I spent uh, seven years gathering two and a half thousand words from 33 different um, languages and dialects and sub-dialects within the British Isles. And, and then I wrote Landmarks, a series of essays around those glossaries. And since I published that um, a similar Glossary work is underway now in, in Florida, and there's a Schweizer Deutsch initiative has started up, um, and uh, there are many forms of, uh, of, of recovery, salvage of this landscape language. Last year, we um, brought out a book um, on the sounds birds are, um, are doing so, and um, there is a great loss also of uh, words that express the, the special sounds of birds. So we found out it's a very nice book. And um, we also, in, in 2009, we started um, the translation of 4,000 pages, um, um, uh, Jean-Henri Fabre's um, Souvenirs. Um, it's a book um, on um, description of insects. And, um, and the funny thing is that um, when I started um, publishing this work, it's in 10 volumes, it's really huge. Um, I did not um, recognize that it's also a big work of archiving um, um, a world that's going, um, that, that's passing now. Um, would you say that uh, nature writing is also about archiving? It's a very good question, it's very well put. I mean, thinking about Fabre now, as we are catching up with the, the insect, the invertebrate diversity loss, you do, it seems like a, a work of, a vital work of archiving. I think of other forms of archiving, like the archiving that's happening at the, speed, the seed vault in Spitsbergen, where hundreds of thousands of seeds maintaining and preserving the possibility of a future diversity, anticipating a global breakdown, are being archived in sub zero temperatures um, in, in extraordinary quantities. And the, the seed vault, as some of you will know, is, is, sets, is set at a height on the mountain that has been measured 
in anticipation of the highest possible sea level rise that's foreseeable within, I think it's a 500,000 year time line, and then the highest possible tsunami wave that could be triggered by a tectonic activity in order that even with the maximum sea level rise and even with the most catastrophic tsunami, the seed vault would still be above water level. That all fell apart last year when the melt rates of permafrost on Spitsbergen reached such extent that the vault was partially flooded by meltwater. Uh, you can't put your ark high enough on the mountain these days. And I wonder actually if I could read from Underland now because the, I hadn't intended the DJ link, as it were, but it goes straight into a chapter from Underland about ice and now. Can I do that? Perfect. Okay. Do I have time? Yes. So I, I've just, just finished this book. It, it's taken six and a half years since, it, since I began work on it, and uh, it's nearly done for me. And it's the longest book I've ever written. It's about 150,000 words at the moment. And it's the deepest book in certainly one sense I've ever written. And it's definitely the strangest book I'd ever written until I finished Ness, which we won't get onto, but that's too weird. Um, and it, it's, it's about underworlds in many, many senses. But it's also, I came to realize it's also a document of what it's felt like to live a little through the time we're living through. And these are extraordinary times. We're on an epochal edge. We are, everyone here is of the generation that will move from the Holocene into the Anthropocene. And you may think that that's only stratigraphers' business. That's just what geologists are telling us. But Homo sapiens has only lived through two Earth epochs, the Pleistocene and the Holocene. And now we're about to enter a third. And everyone here will be there when it happens, I hope, um, in the next year or so. And while I, while I was in Greenland with Helen Mort, the amazing Helen Mort, in fact, the um, Quaternary, the Anthropocene Working Group of the Quaternary Stratigraphers recommended the adoption of the Anthropocene epoch as the age of man, the, the time when our species is leaving such a signature in the rock record that it will last for millions of years. There are many things to say about the Anthropocene, but I just want to read from Underland about going out to southeast Greenland at a period of very intense melt. And um, quite a lot of it's in the present tense. A lot of the book's in the present tense. Late summer off the north coast of Kulasuk Island, southeast Greenland, and a single iceberg sweats in the channel. The berg is vast, a curved triangle like the mainsail of a yacht, perhaps a hundred feet from sea to summit with a rounded tip. It glistens white as wet wax. Dark blue of the channel water, sharp blue of the cloudless sky. Daytime moon above a shield-shaped mountain. On the far side of the channel, a glacier runs steeply down into the water, ten kilometres or so distant, the cobalt of the carving face faintly visible. The submerged bulk of the berg can be seen as a bottle green aura. It's low tide. On the foreshore of Kulasuk Bay, a man is leaning over something in the rocks. He's straight-legged, bent at the waist. His sleeves are rolled up and his arms are red to the elbow. He wears a luminous yellow high-vis jacket and hose-down clothes. The carcass of a porpoise lies slack across kelpie boulders. He uses one hand to grip a flap of the black skin of the porpoise, then peels it back towards him using the curved flensing knife in his other hand to cut away the meat as it comes. It looks like he is helping the porpoise out of a wetsuit. Fifty or so wooden houses, brightly coloured outer panels, red, blue, yellow, red, blue, yellow, each built on a smooth table of rock, rounded off by the glaciers that covered the island. This is Kulasuk, more aviary than village. White dabs of anti-rust paint mark the nail heads on the outer panels. Each house has an apron of plywood cut to match the contours of the rock on which it sits. Many of the houses are lashed down with steel cables for when the big winter storms come. The knackerjack, the catabatic wind that rushes down off the ice cap, can reach 200 miles an hour here. There's no wind today. The air's warm. It's unprecedentedly warm. The berg sweats. The man flenses the porpoise. 
On the east side of the bay, in the lee of a crag, a slew of white wooden crosses drops down almost to the tide line. They're different sizes. Some have wonky crossbars. From a distance, it looks like a snow patch or a tiny glacier running off the steeper ground. It's a cemetery, one of the few sites in the village where enough topsoil is accumulated to bury a body. The air is suddenly split by a high howl, and immediately 30 or 40 other howls join it in chorus. Some of the huskies are sitting and howling at the sky, straight-backed, full-on wolf howls. One straining so hard the chain is taut as a bar, and the collar cuts at the howl, strangles it. Four children and a husky pup are on a big trampoline, bouncing together, the children's feet stretching the net down almost to the rock on which the trampoline is set. The husky spreads out his legs, braces himself. When the howling starts, the pup howls too, and then the children howl as well, bouncing and howling and laughing together. The berg sweats. The man flenses the porpoise. The children and the dogs bounce and howl. All that hot summer before I go to Greenland, ice across the world is yielding up its long-held secrets. The Arctic is melting, and as it melts, what is locked within its depths comes to the surface. Things that would have been better staying buried are released. On the Siachen Glacier in the Karakoram, where Indian and Pakistani troops have been fighting a forgotten war since, the 19, since 1984, the melting ice reveals empty artillery shells, ice axes, boots, and all the other waste that human conflict generates, including bodies. On the Yamal Peninsula between the Kara Sea and the Gulf of Ob, 12,000 square kilometers of permafrost melt Cemeteries and animal burial grounds turn to slush. Reindeer corpses, dead of anthrax 70 years earlier, are exposed to the air. 23 people are infected. One, a child, dies. Russian vets travel to the region dressed in white anti-contamination suits, vaccinating reindeers and their herders. Russian troops burn infected corpses in high-temperature pyres. Russian agriculturalists say that nothing will ever grow in the region again. Russian epidemiologists predict other releases from Arctic burial sites, smallpox victims from the late 1800s, giant viruses that have been long dormant in the frozen bodies of mammoths. In northwest Greenland, a Cold War US military base and the toxic waste it contains begins to move towards the surface. Camp Century was excavated by the US Army Engineering Corps in 1959. They tunneled into the ice cap and created a town a three-kilometre subterranean network of passageways housing laboratories, a shop, a hospital, a cinema, a chapel, accommodation for 200 soldiers, all powered by the world's first mobile nuclear generator. The camp was abandoned in 1967. The departing soldiers took the reaction chamber of the nuclear generator with them, but they left the rest of the camp's infrastructure intact under the ice, including the biological, chemical and radioactive waste it contained assuming, as the Pentagon closure report put it, that it would be preserved for eternity by the perpetual snowfalls of northern Greenland. It's all still buried there, 200,000 litres of diesel fuel, unknown amounts of radioactive coolant including, and toxic organic pollutants, including PCBs. As global temperatures have risen, so snowmelt is, forced to ex is forecast to exceed snow accumulation in the region of Camp Century. In a dynamic I have seen so often in the Underland that it's become a master trope, troublesome history thought long since buried is emerging again. We must show a care for things not yet surfaced. That's a quote from someone else. The moulins of Greenland roar, the carving faces of Greenland's glaciers thunder, icebergs sweat in Greenland's fjords. Polar scientists predict a total absence of Arctic sea ice by September, the creation of an ocean where once there was ice sheet. The highest rates of ice loss are in the northwest and the southeast of the country where I'm heading. Uneasy stories circulate about disappearances in the ice. A Russian businessman has flown in on the east coast, arrived in a camel skin coat and a briefcase, and never flown out again. A Japanese hiker has vanished in the west of the country, been missing for weeks. People speak half-jokingly of the Kisawak, the wild creature that roams the land and snatches unwary travellers an animate version of the glacial crevasse or silky thin sea ice. In this region, at this time of history, it feels as if there are many places where one might fall right through the world's surface.
there is a different tone in this um, in this book to your previous books. And um, would you say that um, in the last five, six years, um, all around landmarks as well, um, you shifted from poetic to um, to political? Um, I hope so. Um, I mean, the, the, lo the Lost Words is... I wrote The Lost Words, took me two years, 20 short spells. It'll change the world more than any of my 400-page books, <laughs> and it makes me wonder why I bother writing long books, all of which is to say that the outcomes of writing in particular are very hard to predict. Um, sometimes, as Rebecca Solnit puts it, you scatter your seeds, They do not flourish, rats eat them, nothing grows. And sometimes they take years to grow or they grow into things that you never saw within them in the first place. So there is no doubt that Underland is, is the most explicitly and I hope bracingly political of the books I've written. And it feels impossible to be living in the time that we are now, and not to write in response to it in some way, not to be reactive to it. And I think all the best writing in this incredible field, this forest, this jungle of literature and culture and cross-media making and collaboration and all the things that have happened in Britain are happening in Germany now, are happening in other countries too. They're all motivated, they're all political in their ways. Some, as they say, are just more political than others. Do you want people become angry? We had, um, we had a reading with Anna Löwenhaupt Singh about um, three months ago, and we presented her book on, uh, it's called The Mushroom at the End of the World, um, about the possibilities of living on the ruins of capitalism. And um, it's a... Um, a small charismatic woman um, in front of uh, 300 um, young people uh, in the Berlin Haus der Kultur in der Welt, and and she um, and she was so angry, and and she tried to, and she she already said it uh, that she wants to make people angry on what's going on. Um, is this your intention as well? Well, uh, Anna Tsing's remarkable book isn't a very angry book. That's true, it's not angry, but she wants to push something. She wants to uh, create a new mo movement, a new awareness of um, what's going on. Well, it, it's, it's fascinating to hear that because it is, it is a very political book, but it's also a very quiet and subtle book. It's about understanding ecology as a, f as a form of entanglement, understanding, as Gregory Bateson says, we, we are not outside the ecology for which we plan. And Singh's book shows us how entangled deeply entangled we are. Um, and it's interesting to hear that she is angry as well. Um, I'm angry, um, but it's, it's very easy to be angry. And whenever I, I um, post or tweet or write about these things, the most common response I get is, what can I do? This fills the threads, the Twitter threads. Um, what can I do? There is a huge wish for leadership in this area. Uh, in an odd way, we're getting it at the moment in the UK, thanks to Michael Gove, who um, looked like a fox being put in charge of a hen house when he was appointed as environment secretary in this country, but is pushing through a series of surprising changes. Um, and uh, so things, things are happening. But um, I think the most active thing I've done is to, to co-found this youth charity, conservation charity, which is Royalties from the Lost Words get do every copy. The royalties get donated. Part of the royalties get donated to Action for Conservation, and it works with children in in high areas of high deprivation, schools with high pupil premium levels above 50 percent. And we um, we work really closely with them. We we try to move from wonder, which maybe is where we began our conversation, to change, and to to in induce long term change in them and the societies that they. They, they live in and, and work in and will live in and work in. And that's hard. We all know it. Change is hard. We all probably fight ourselves over change. I wish I could do better at this. I wish I could be a better green citizen now in the Anthropocene. It's hard to change ourselves, let alone other people. So change sometimes comes in crooked 
cat's cradly ways, and that's what literature can be best at. Now, you mentioned um, several times uh, the word Anthropocene, and um, now I have a very um, egoist um, um, wish. Could you read something from Ness? Because it is said it's an Anthropocene. Um, it's it's on the Anthropocene. It's a it's a short piece. Um, Robert told me that he has just finished, and it must be very strange. And maybe we can um, um, hear something from it. Okay, this this would probably better be the last thing I say because um, people here who need a drink. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, we we can we can wait. Maybe um, we can continue. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'll um, yeah. Okay, I will read from Ness. Um, I'm very curious what is it, what's it about. Yeah. Uh, so I finished this after two and a half years' work on um, Friday. And um, it's, uh, I don't know quite what to call it. I think the closest I've come is a medieval mystery play for the Anthropocene. And it imagines in a very, very strange... It was written in the shadow, most of it in the shadow of the Trump... Kim nuclear standoff earlier this year when the world seemed likely to end in ways that were rather more rapid than climate change. Um, and it, it really reawakened in me nuclear fears that were deep in my childhood. I'm of that age where many of the younger people here aren't of this age, but where you, you know, that's what I wept about. That's what I came down the stairs at the age of 12, um, needing my parents because I thought that we would be under the table uh, uh, waiting for the fallout. Um, so it went in deep young. Anyway, this, Im this imagines a very strange figure called the Armourer in something called the Green Chapel, which is also a place of worship, but nuclear worship. And it also imagines five kind of manifestations of the land converging on this chapel, this Green Chapel, to prevent the detonation of, of this bomb. And I'll just read you a couple of pages. This is the very beginning. These are the five superheroes, as it were. Look, five forms moving fast through the forests to Ness. Look, here it comes. Its bones are plastic. It builds itself from pallet slat and bottle top, rises from sift, is lashed and trussed with fishing line. It is drift. It has cuttlefish nails and sea poppy horns. It breathes in rain and it breathes out rust. Look, here he comes. His bones are willow and he sings in birds. He rises in marsh, slips forward by ripple and shiver. Between his tree ribs, birds flutter, then swoop ahead to settle, sing, quiver. His head is a raven's, his eyes are wren's nests. By day from his throat fly finch and firecrest, and in anger he speaks only in swifts. Look, here she comes. Her skin is lichen and her flesh is moss and her bones are fungi. She breathes in spores and she moves by hyphae. She is a rock breaker, a tree speaker, a place shaper, a world maker. Look, here they come. Their eyes are hagstones and their words are shingle. They rise on the shore, rock cord, flint beings, scattering chert to signal their passage, sending stones through time to foretell their seeings. Look, here as comes who exists only as likeness, moves as mist and also as metal, cannot be grasped or forced, is the strongest and strangest and youngest and oldest of all the five, slipping through trees past houses, rolled by the wind at years, each minute rolled by the wind as if through time and in it. It, he, she, they, as. All five know where they must go and with what they must grapple. And where they must go is to the Green Chapel. And I'll just take us briefly into the Green Chapel and then I'll sit down. So it then cuts to a more play-like, so there's six scenes in the Green Chapel. In the Green Chapel one, 
The armourer says, who will describe the chapel's design and position? I, says the engineer. Ten tall, thin crosses on the west wall and ten on the east. Five on the north and the south wall is open. Its status as a building of worship is unmistakable, so too the nature of its God. Its roof is ferro-concrete and strikingly vaulted. Its pillars are ferro-concrete and devoid of fluting. Its architecture is a perfect marriage of function and form. It lies close to the centrifuge, close to the armory, and its ruination is controlled. The armourer says, Who will describe the chapel's ornament and flourish? I, says the botanist, looking thoughtfully around. Elder and bracken thrive on its outer walls. Shingle fills the nave and the transept. Gulls have built nests in our control panels. Its lichens and its mosses are fascinatingly many, though I will not detain you with their Linnaeans now. The armourer says, do not. Tell me instead, is the chapel fit for our purpose? It is, says the botanist. The armourer says, who will number the congregation? I, says the ornithologist, stepping forwards and bowing to the armourer before speaking. Our congregation numbers the gulls, the blackbacks who have travelled so very far to be with us today. Our congregation numbers the ghosts of those who worked here to make today possible, including the indentured Chinese labourers who kept grasshoppers in jars to remind them of home, and the German prisoners of war who raised their voices in song. The armourer cuts across the ornithologist, says, Enough of your pieties. Who will take the service in the chapel? I'll stop there. I told you it was strange. Yes, but uh, we see that you did not lose your sense for poetic uh, writing and your sense for literacy. I missed out the sweary bits. There's, there's quite a few sweary bits. Um, of course, we have, an, uh, we have a lot of other questions, but we wanted um, to give you the possibility as well to um, ask some questions if you want to. Me? Uh, no. Oh, then. The, the audience. <laughs> Do we have a mic uh, roving microphone or um oh, great um it was really fascinating thank you for your readings um when you spoke about your newer text is it underworld uh, un underland yeah underland why did you choose to write it in the present tense um, and also in the first person Um, was that conscious? No, that, that, yes, it, it's a very good question. Um, I chose to write it in the present tense because it's in part a book about how many times we live in at the same moment, mostly unaware, um, which is to say that one of the things the Anthropocene asks us to do is to, is to be good ancestors, as Jonas Salk puts it, which is to say to think about what we're leaving behind us and what will be inherited by our inheritors in many generations' time. So it, stretch, it begins to stretch time for us. It makes it deep going forwards. I've always been interested in deep time going backwards, geologically, but I'm increasingly interested in, in deep time going forwards as well. And so the book, the present is the, the fold of the book, the, the, point about in time about which it always folds. So I wanted to write all the, the moments just absolutely in the present and then allow other time, times to m move themselves out. So there are times when I'm, a lot of cities are built on limestone. Paris is built on limestone. It's a really good building stone often, Lutetian limestone in Paris. And, um, and when you're down in the catacombs of Paris, you're in a previous Earth epoch. You're within it, but you're also within the time of that city at the medieval beginnings of its making when the earth is being extracted, the rock is being extracted to build the city. You're also in the moment of technological time. You're also in the moment of lived time. So I, I needed to fix one point, the present, the, the narrative present, from which everything else could then 
complexly tangle itself out in terms of time. Um, the first person, well, this is a big conversation. I think the first person runs many risks and brings many goods in the best sense of that word with it. It, 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 op it allows you to be vulnerable to the world. It opens the world into your body and your voice. It isn't necessarily a declaration of egotism. When Henry David Thoreau wrote Walden, which is seen as one of the founding texts of modern day environmental, environmentalism as well as many other things, the printer ran out of the letter I when he was typesetting it because Thoreau talked so much in the first person. When Ralph Waldo Emerson tries to talk about being <laughs> diffused into the world in 1836 in nature, crossing Boston Common, he says, I am nothing, I see all, I am part or particle of God. The very moment he's declaring his dissolving is the moment he reaches for the first person. Badly used, it's a dreadful, hostile, acrid body odor of a grammar. Well used, it's humble and rich. And I'm not saying I use it well all the time, so, but that's what it's there for. Um, you, shown us, you, do, you, ha, you have shown us in the past, and you've done that here today, is that there's a lot of magic and power in the simplest of words, and that you can use them for a purpose. It's just that I think, I teach academic writing, and uh, to German academics mostly, and they do just the opposite. And I feel that we should make use of what you show to us to help scientists change some, something about ch things like ch climate change. But how can we do that? How can we teach people how to make better use of simple words instead of thinking that you need some fancy language if you have a serious purpose? Well, th thank you, first of all. Um, I, whenever I'm with scientists, I always say I feel, I borrow W.H. Auden's line, I feel like a shabby curate in a room full of bishops. I, I just. I just go all kind of lab, Labrador-eyed at scientists because they know stuff and I don't. Um, and many of them are brilliant users of language. I think brilliant communicators. Some of the geologists I know, earth scientists, are, they speak beautifully about rocks. Um, <laughs> that is possible. What are you laughing at? Um, um, but I, I think... I think, I mean, science thinks very hard about public communication, I think, these days, and particularly those working in, in political spheres of science, which I know you're not meant to think of your research as political, but inevitably you do, and particularly in North America at the moment. Um, I suppose I'm interested in something like the plastics crisis and the extraordinary corner that's just been turned, I hope, following Blue Planet 2. And that, it seems to me, is this amazing policy triumph, cultural awareness triumph, that unites hard science, technology in the form of filming, astonishing filming abilities, natural history, and culture, stories, language, words, people, communication. And what, what has happened in Britain and what I know is happening in Europe, what is, I mean, Modi has yesterday declared that he will uh, make India free of single-use plastics by 2022. It's an impossible claim. He doesn't tend to deliver on his promises. He'll probably be voted out at the next elections anyway. But um, uh, it is better that our politicians are trying than that they are fully passive, which was what was happened before the Blue Planet 2 effect. So I suppose I don't see literature and science as, uh, as competitors. I always see them as collaborators. I see science at its best as an incredibly powerful facilitator of communication. I see something like plastics, the plastics turn, and I think, how do we do that for biodiversity loss? Which is much harder, because everyone can change the way they behave around plastics. Everyone can own the plastics crisis in a personal way. Biodiversity loss feels much more difficult to intervene in personally as well as politically. 
That became another answer, but I think I, think I want to say a word for scientists. Um, I'm a professor for journalism with a focus on environmental journalism, and um, I would be interested in knowing if um, your work, especially also nature writing in Great Britain, had a certain impact or a visible impact on environmental journalism and science journalism in the UK. So is there more reporting, for example, about the loss of biodiversity or about um, pollution problems in general? Or do you have the impression that there is a, some kind of reaction? <laughs> well, I, I may not be the best person to ask about that because I probably exist in my own echo chamber. I, I will just say that, that the Guardian newspaper continues to be an absolute beacon of, of environmental reporting. And, uh, and many other kinds of reporting as well. And that, that they, they continue to, to cover this extensively, and they have reach because of, because of what they've done digitally. They have reach, and I'm sure it's widely read in, in Europe too. Um, beyond that, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I, there, is always, uh, there is always clearly a political agenda pressing on, on, on different forms of coverage. There, the government has just re released what's called Green Futures, which is the 25-year environmental plan, you probably, probably know, uh, in, in Britain. It's inspiringly long on, on, on hope, hope and vision, as it needs to be. It's disappointingly short on teeth, unsurprisingly. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's brilliant to see things like intrinsic good appearing in the discourse of... of policy making at the highest level. And it's uh, a, a fabulous triumph on the part of the civil servants and, and DEFRA involved. But again, there's nothing quite to, to tie it to action yet, to tie it to legislative change. So I think we have a, we have a healthy and unhealthy environmental media in, our con in, in Britain at the moment. I don't know how things are feel here. How do they feel here? Oh, the, the microphone's gone, but if you could just, I'd be interested to hear. Now, um, so green topics in media have developed really a lot in the last 10 years, especially climate change. But we see at the same time a lot of reporting about green lifestyle, so about the soft topics, there is much out. And at the same time, there is a lack of reporting about biodiversity, about, um, so for sure in the big media, so Süddeutsche Zeitung, Spiegel and Zeit, you have it always steadily. But for example, the big papers like um, Zeit or also Spiegel have decided also to not do any, uh, any more climate cover stories because they don't sell. So that's one decision that was taken a couple of years ago um, in some uh, news departments. So this is one example that there are, there's still a lot of problems. So we have a lot of soft uh, green reporting, but a lack, um, especially also in regional media about biodiversity, plastic, water, and, and stuff. So it's, I see it twofold, and I'm, I'm a bit skeptic towards the future because there are, there's a tendency to, uh, toward writing about everything, and colleagues that have been writing a lot about climate change for years and years, they, are, they used to be somehow fired or um, retired. So it's, it's a lack of specialization that is just happening right now. Thank you. Another question? So thank you for listening. Oh, there's thank you. This is a slightly different question, different focus. Um, what do you see as the antecedents in terms of nature writing within British literature or within other forms of writing. Um, I, I may be getting this wrong, but there was one of the things that you read that reminded me a little bit in some of its rhythms of Jared Manley Hopkins, and I don't know what else you may see as part of that flow. Um, you mentioned at the beginning that, that it's difficult in German to find a category for this writing. Um, and I found that an interesting comment, both about the way that Germany does, I think, require things to fit into categories. Um, <laughs> 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 but, 
but, but also quite an interesting thing to explore because Germany is not short of writing that draws on nature, um, whether you look at Goethe or many, many other things. So I think that's quite an interesting comment. But the question really specifically to you is where do you see the antecedents? What do you feel you're drawing on? Well, uh, those who are staying at the seminar, we have a, we have a panel discussion on this, and it's, uh, that's the long answer. What, 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 do you, what do you call nature writing here? No, we, we call it nature writing, but it's uh, kind of a... <laughs> in English. In English, but it's kind of a working title, because I think that the literary market in, in Germany um, really demands um, patterns and demands... Um, drawers um, to uh, and to fit in genres you know we have we have not we don't have uh, the differentiation between fiction non fiction but we have novels we have the sachbuch and so on and and the nature writing as we understand it it is a little bit between the genres and um, and i think that the booksellers don't know where to put it and when um, and and that um, that has a influence on the production of um, of literary. That's that's my theory or my hypothesis. What what influence does it have? That uh, the writers write for a market, and uh, and the market says, um, okay, we don't have a place for this kind of writing. Um, when you are looking for our Naturkunden books uh, in the bookstores here. Um, sometimes they are in the Sachbuch department, sometimes in the literary department, uh, but there's no real place for it. And uh, so they, they don't know how to deal with it. Well, that sounds to me like an excellent state of affairs, um, because why would one wish to be writing into a market category that was already established in order to conform to its requirements? I mean, I know there is a market reason why one would do that, but... Um, it seems to me that when this writing is at its best, it, that's one of the reasons I feel uneasy calling it nature writing. It's become a brand in, in Britain. It was a brand in America during the 80s and, and 90s, um, and it went through the cycles that all such genre brands go, which is excitement, uh, contempt, parody, ossification, uh, excommunication, it's done that, done that in, um, done that in America, and it's it's going through some of those cycles here. But when it's at its best is when it's breaking rules, when it's uh, hybridizing, when it's biodiversifying its voice, its form, its antecedents. And I suppose I can answer your question and instantiate that by saying, as some people here will know, because I say it some uh, often and have written it down a few times as well, that the book that made me a writer is a book called Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez, which I happen to know is actually in the acknowledgments or, or, or is a key lodestar for two, I think three of the other writers here, possibly all of them. Um, and, and I met that book in, in the late 90s in a bookstore in, in Canada when I was climbing and mountaineering and walking on my own. And I carried it, though it was heavy, and, uh, and it just it changed my life. And that book it's not nature writing, it's politics, it's cultural history, it's anthropology, it's natural history, it's a first-person prose poetry of an intensity of vision that makes you feel like he's handed you the binoculars there and then. Um, it's an extraordinary, angry, beautiful, deep, old, wise book, and it, it obeys no known rules. Um, so I think uh, nature writing will be at its best while it continues to be dissatisfied with what it's being called. And when it crosses boundaries and, um, uh, and, and causes trouble. And so that's why I quite like the idea of it continuing being called nature writing in English in inverted commas in Germany, because it'll encourage it to stay unruly.